Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, fascinating presentation. As I find, it's quite extraordinary, I think, within the overall curriculum of uh, this conference. Um, and uh, we're honored to actually start this wonderful day, uh, the, four, uh, the fourth day of the conference, uh, with some very interesting speakers. Um, Sem, uh, could you maybe move one slide forward? Um, so we are talking generally about today about the visualization of microbes. Um, or, or more the how to identify good material for that. Um, it's all anchored within the um, Microbiology Literacy Initiative. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so that's actually part of the program. So I will start off with the background information. Uh, I'm only here to set the stage really, and the rest is then done by Sam Balanza and uh, my co-presenters later on. Uh, so I'll give you a short introduction and talk about the unmet need, why this project even started. Uh, Sam will talk about multimedia learning. Then there'll be a short video to just show what we did and how. And then the my four co-presenters of students will talk about the guideline in action. So you see a little bit about how this works and don't just see a guideline, but actually uh, the whole thing. Also with with, with GIFs, it's, it's very nice, very beautiful, I find. And uh, anyhow, a slide, uh, next slide, please, Sam. So short intro introduction to myself. My name is James Kenneth Timmis. I have a background in political science and uh, health policy. At the moment, I'm studying at the Fine Universität Amsterdam as a PhD student, almost done actually. Um, I'm, an, I'm an advisory member of the, um, multi, of the uh, uh, microbiology, microbiology Literacy Initiative Multimedia Teaching Aid ta Task Force. Sorry, long long term. Um, and uh, so there are multiple task forces and one of them is actually, you know, responsible for thinking about how to best implement uh, a specific teaching aids. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and I'm the academic supervisor of the project together with Sem who will talk uh, as a second person. Next slide, please. So this all sort of started off 2019 uh, when we published this editorial um, and uh, it's, it's, it really builds the foundation um, of why uh, the Microbiology Literacy in Society is so urgent. And we have a whole list of different themes and we describe this also against the background of the SDGs and the grand challenges. So it's a, it's a, it's a very comprehensive editorial also with a timeline. If you want, you can go to the website and have a, have a look. Just some, some metrics about this. So it's, been, it's already been translated into 11 languages. So, so, so we have 12 languages in total. Um, and we have Chinese and Hindi and Russian and, and Spanish, and so there are a lot of different languages there. Um, it has 42 citations according to ResearchGate, and it has a very high interest score. Uh, so it's in the top 2% on of all publications on ResearchGate. As you can also see, I put the Outmetric score here, 490. It's been tweeted. Oh, so it, somehow someone's tweeted about it 570 times, for example. It's, it has a lot of momentum. Uh, next slide, please. So, and I think this is the core quote of the whole uh, initiative. Uh, you'll actually find it, I think, in the abstract uh, in, in italics. Uh, so, microbiology literacy needs to become part of the world citizen job description. Um, and I think this is one of the most important elements to think about um, while you're actually looking at this, uh, this presentation. Next slide, please. So the goal, and I'm talking now a bit more about the, the microbiology literacy initiative, just to give you background, the, uh, the content of the other uh, project that we're actually re reporting about uh, will be spoken about a little bit later. Um, so the goal of the Microbiology Literacy Initiative is to establish the basic understanding in society of micro microbial processes involved in everyday life and beyond. Beyond would be something like climate change. Uh, everyday life might be uh, birth, a cesarean section or normal birth, or for example, having a pet. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And the whole idea is to facilitate um, and improve foundation for informed decisions at all levels. So that could be the individual level. Um, you know, am I going to have a pet because it might help uh, establish a healthy immune system or not? Uh, might I have a cesarean section or not? Um, you know, do I use a lot of pl plastic packed goods because, you know, I know that they are clogging up the oceans or do I decide not to do that? Uh, so, but it can all, all the way, be all the way up to the policy level. Um, so it's, it's, it's very broad. The point is, is capacity to understand and, and to build this, uh, uh, yeah, to build this decision-making capacity. Um, the approach um, is essentially to create an international but generic school curriculum and uh, with complementary teaching materials. Um, and they are uh, 
the whole the the the, the concept is is very user friendly. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment a little bit more. But it's to support teachers in picking for their teaching everyday um, lessons that they can teach them to the children, and also have various connections to, for example, as I said earlier on, the SDGs, or um, also just very daily uh, implications. Next slide, please. So these are essentially the activities. So there are things for topic frameworks. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, so in progress, 200 plus, uh, so, or, or commitment, sorry. Um, 110 have already been submitted, 17 are complete, and hopefully the completion will be in 2021. So it will be a, a huge uh, repository of, of very nice um, uh, teaching aids um, for, but, but, but in a written format, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Then uh, in 2020, uh, there was a publication by Terry McGinnity um, about class excursions, which is also very interesting. You should also look at that if you're interested. Uh, so that's one of the first complementary component. Then there are TF specific, so topic framework specific class experiments. That's in progress. Also another complement. Then comes the complement that we are working on, which is a topic framework specific multimedia teaching aids. That's MTA. So MLI is Microbiology Literacy Initiative. MTAs are multimedia teaching aids. That's in progress, and we have been put into this as uh, a group working on a project to look at guidelines. Um, but that we'll talk about a bit more later on. And there will be some trialing and some piloting uh, in, in end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, and uh, that's very, we're quite excited to see what happens there. Next slide, please. So this is a top, this is the, the, the structure or topic framework. So you have an idea of what that could be. So essentially, obviously, you have the title page and you have like a, a little picture and, and maybe a question, which is supposed to spark interest. You have the storyline, so you could, that helps children to understand, or, the, or also the, the educator to understand how to connect this to maybe, let's say, daily uh, uh, life. Then there's a TF body, which describes then, let's say, the more technical aspects, so the brief descriptions of microbial activities that underlie control or influence the show discussed. Then the relevance, there we again we come back to the SDGs and the grand challenges, potential implications for decisions. As I said, that's a very important component. Uh, then the pupil participation exercises. Um, and then, which is probably more interesting even then for the educators or for other scholars, is the evidence base. So for further reading and, and also to add the teaching aids. Um, and then there's a glossary. So it's quite a nice um, overall uh, uh, collation of information. Next slide, please. So this is the, the initial example that there ever was, uh, was pet dogs. And it starts with this, as I said, this question. Uh, Maisie has just been given a gorgeous little puppy for her birthday. Can we have one too? So, what are the, the, the pros, uh, or not the pros, but what, what are the what are the benefits that it would be to have a dog? Um, next slide, please. And I, I can't I can't show you the whole overview because I don't have the time. But um, just to get a quick idea of the microbiology or the, uh, the the microbiology related issues that I covered, and this is just an excerpt. Um, so, there's an exposure to micro, micro, microbial diversity, and how does that impact the, the development of a healthy immune system? What are pet infections and zoonosis? Vaccines and vaccination, foot pro, footprint of dog food production. That's quite a, quite a let's say, more, more unexpected one, maybe. Uh, it's quite interesting, though. So there are all these different topics, how microbiology is related to the individual daily, or as I said, beyond uh, climate change topic uh, framework. Next slide, please. So um, now that we've seen the different activities going on, the different products being made, um, so the, the need actually is now really to provide visualization of microbes and microbial processes, um, to address different learning styles and speeds. Um, also, for for example, people with learning disability, how do we, you know, how do we cater to them and, and, and give them the maximum benefit of these uh, of, the, of this curriculum, um, and to deepen the learning experience. The approach is obviously to add to the to the TFs. Um, the class excursions have been done, the experiments which are being done at the moment, and the uh, and MTAs. Um, and TF-specific TF MTAs. However, there is no dedicated database of, of MTAs. There are a lot of them scattered around the internet, but there's no dedicated one. Um, and there's no guidance on how to actually gauge the appropriateness of one MTA over another with a, for a certain learning goal and with a certain setting. Next slide, please. So essentially, 
this, this is where I get pretty much to the end because I want the rest to be uh, described by, by seven of the students. So um, essentially what we thought, okay, well, we have this need in the task force. We have, to, we have this need, how are we going to do this? So essentially I, Sam, uh, Ken Timmis and Paul Sainsbury, uh, who is also the commissioner, by the way, of this project, um, or we call them commissioners of the person that has given us the, um, the, the project to do with the students. Um, we all developed together this concept of how to uh, find and how to, so first of all, to create a database, obviously, and also to, to appraise these things. Um, so, so we developed this project together um, and we developed it as a team project, especially now with COVID um, and with the, the lockdown, which is, I know, slowly easing, but still, uh, we thought, well, it would be nice to have not only two students, but actually four uh, working together in tandem to have um yeah to have this team feeling and uh, we feel it work work quite well uh, the duration is 20 weeks so beginning of february to the end of uh, june and uh, so sam and i um the academic we, we are the academic supervisors and but there has been additional input and supervision by ken and paul and the deliverable uh, is an nta appraisal and creation guideline uh so we don't want only to be able to appraise uh, what's there, but we want to actually give people instruction on how to, if they create them, because there are no topic specific, or well, there are very few TF specific uh, uh, MTAs out there at the moment. Uh, so uh, we would have to uh, give people instructions on how to create them maybe. So that's that's the idea behind this. Next slide, please. And now it's Emster. Yes, thank you, James. It always amazes me how you can fit so much information in such a short time frame. Uh, so, I am Sam Barense, uh, and I will tell you a bit about uh, multimedia education and science education. I'm a researcher in science education and science communication at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. And in my research there, I focus uh, and investigate how we can effectively design multimedia to be of value for science education. It has been the reason why I've been brought on board uh, for this project. Uh, so personally, the reason I pursue this, this domain of, of science and multimedia integration is that for me in, in my childhood, and I guess some of you might think I'm still in my childhood, uh, I was a big fan of, of Brainiac and Mythbusters. And, and the curiosity that was, well, uh, kindled back then, uh, I still carry around as a researcher these days. Uh, and in the limited experience that I have, uh, I've seen how kids these days acquire an interest in science that sticks with them for the rest of their lives via these types of scientific shows and multimedia. Um, in my research, I uh, specifically focus on the balance between stimulating scientific interest and portraying science truthfully in uh, multimedia. And the thing is that in these types of multimedia, such as videos, games, cartoons, animations, uh, science is often portrayed as a fun and, and visually exciting. Um, for example, in video clips on YouTube. But then the drawback is that uh, science, the whole scientific process as being complex is not portrayed correctly. So my research question is then, how can we find and make a balance in, in making science ent entertaining uh, with multimedia to stimulate scientific interest, while at the same time portraying science as the complex field it really is? An example of someone who, according to me, uh, does that really well, uh, can be found on the most popular YouTube science channel called Veritasium. Some of you might have heard from that. Uh, the host of this channel, you can see in the, in the bottom right, is Derek Muller, my idol and also a researcher. So in his 2008 uh, PhD thesis on designing effective multimedia for physics education, uh, he states the following, which to me clearly uh, demonstrates the need to think about why we should research multimedia in education. It would be ideal if students could learn about science by working in groups, devising and performing experiments and discussing their ideas with knowledgeable, experienced teachers. However, unfortunately, researchers, resources at all levels of education are limited and students must often learn by themselves with textbooks, videos and online multimedia. The design of effective learning resources is therefore an important consideration for the science education community and I try to build on his philosophy. So then on to the reason why we have virtually get it here today. Um, teachers nowadays are increasingly using multimedia uh, for their lessons with various learning aims. So for example, if you as a teacher are introducing your students to a whole new scientific phenomenon, phenomenon to get them interested, 
uh, you might want to use a short video or cartoon to spark the interest. On the other hand, if you as a teacher want to stimulate deeper thinking skills in a longer research project, you might want to consider a video game uh, with a long engagement period and a storyline. In other words, uh, different types of multimedia are more suitable for various learning aims. Um, which brings me to the, the backbone of this study uh, that, have, that we've been doing and still uh, conducting right now. Uh, is Myers, Richard Myers Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Learning, the CTML theory, um, which was designed by his research group back in 1998. It's the actual absolute benchmark in the field of uh, multimedia learning. Uh, and it's, it, the basic assumption is that people learn more deeply from words and pictures uh, than from words alone. And that's called the multimedia principle. Um, Important to the CTML is that there are three cognitive principles of learning that this theory is based on. The first one is the dual, chan dual channels assumption, which states that the human information processing system uh, includes dual channels, so for visual and auditory processing. The second one is the limited capacity assumption, which states that each of these channels has limited capacity for processing, so information overloads uh, might be, uh, might be uh, a possibility. And then the third one is the active processing assumption, uh, which entails that active learning uh, carries out a coordinated set of cognitive processes during learning. So people need to be active while learning. And so that's the backbone of the study and, and the, the guideline uh, that the students have been uh, devising is uh, built on this theory. So uh, then finally, theories such as the CTML, uh, they are born in the laboratory and they are theory laden, uh, which leaves the question how these interesting but perhaps relatively abstract theories uh, can be translated to be of practical use for teachers in their everyday microbiology lessons. What should, what should they look for online? Uh, where should they look online? And how can they appraise these, type, these types of multimedia? and guidelines on what specific multimedia characteristics can help achieve specific teacher aims are lacking. And therefore, in this project, uh, we, set out, we set out to create such a guideline. Such a guideline. Uh, and that perhaps also in the long term can be tied to the topic framework as discussed by James earlier. So James, Paul, Sainsbury, Kenneth Timmons and I, we signed four master students from the Vrije Universiteit uh, on the fee uh, to carry out this research and create this guideline. And in the following video clip, uh, they will introduce themselves to you and explain, this, this, explain the steps they've undertaken to construct such a guideline. So let me introduce you to Bob, Nicole, Diana, and Roderick. And you can play the video now. Hi, my name is Paul. I'm 28 years old and I'm in my second year of my master's management, policy analysis and entrepreneurship in health and life sciences. In this study, I followed a specialization science communication because I would like to work on bridging the gap between science and society. I will focus on video games because for me, they have always been useful in improving my language skills and my knowledge on subjects like history. Moreover, I'm interested in finding out how this type of multimedia might be used for other educational contexts such as visualizing microbes. Hello, my name is Diana and I'm 23 years old. My background ranges from the medical sciences, in which I focused on during my bachelor's, to the workings and optimization in business management. This year, I started my master MPA to explore the societal nuances in policy and management. I focus in the study on animation, partially because of my own interest and because animation has the ability to visualize the smallest things. On platforms such as YouTube, animation becomes increasingly popular and has shown its diversity. Hi, I'm Roderick. I'm 25 years old and I have a background in biomedical sciences. This is my second year of the Master MPA in which I specialize in management entrepreneurship, uh, which is completely different from the direction of this internship, but uh, I very much enjoy it. I chose the direction of videos as I'm curious on how certain videos are catchy and others are not. And uh, also, why are some videos good for educational uh, purposes and some uh, not? Also, I um, 
went into the direction of the infection susceptibility and vaccines, which is of course now more relevant than ever. Hello, my name is Nicole. I'm 22 years old and I'm in my second year of the Master of Biomedical Sciences. This year I'm focusing on science communication and I really enjoy learning more about the social aspects of science and communicating science to other people. For this project, I chose to focus on comics. They can be a very helpful and engaging tool to visualize complex processes. However, they aren't used that often in education. In addition, I chose to also put some emphasis on the use of anthropomorphism in comics. First, we will give insight into the literature review on didactics and the different multimedia tools, which we use to develop the preliminary version of our guideline. Next, we will go into the data collection methods we employed to create the different multimedia databases. These were used to test our preliminary guideline on. Finally, we will describe how and why we used interviews to validate our guidelines. During this research, we performed a narrative literature review to find sources for creating a best practice guideline to appraise different educational multimedia. This eventually led to 17 articles that describe different didactical theories and standards that were relevant to our guidelines. The most prominent theory found during this stage was the 7E model, which provided us with a way to divide the educational context in which the different multimedia can be applied. So we used two approaches for the collection of multimedia. Diana and I used a pre-coded web scraper tool for YouTube to create a database of 13,000 videos. We then each used specific keywords relevant for our separate researches, infection susceptibility for me and animations for Diana. This provided me with 2,300 videos and Diana with 206. I then appraised the top 20 based on a view, like, and days online ratio. Diana appraised based on a randomized stratification in video length. Bob and Nicole did a manual search on the internet as there was not a single dat database they could use for scraping. Bob used the Steam database, Google Play Store, and performed searches on Google, which delivered 43 games. Nicole searched on Google and Pinterest and exploited articles or databases to get to 89 comics. Both are specified for microbiology. As seen in the literature review, the field of educational multimedia is researched all over the world. Experts such as these researchers and multimedia content creators, such as game developers, comic book creators, already have years of knowledge, both practical and theoretical. So we broadened our horizon. We utilized their knowledge to expand what we knew and find answers in uncertainties in preliminary guidelines. With views and experiences ranging from education in which the use of multimedia is just starting, to institutes where whole courses are taught online, but also from creating multimedia from scratch to integration in didactical methodologies. Their opinion enabled us to improve both the quality of the guidelines and the ease of use for others like teachers, researchers and creators. All of our work and research were combined in one end product, our guidelines. The guidelines consist of two parts. The first part gives recommendations about the possible match between different multimedia and certain educational purposes. These educational purposes are linked to theories such as the 7E model and Bloom's taxonomy. Considerations regarding the different multimedia are pointed out for every educational purpose. The second part provides a ticker box approach for the appraisal of multimedia. We create specific guidelines for comics, video games, videos and animations. So once again, uh, thank you all for being here and welcome to the part where we will demonstrate our appraisal guideline for adequacy review or AGAR in short. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have a figure that shows a brief overview of our guidelines. And these can be seen as uh, the specific steps that you have to undertake when you are using this guideline. Um, you can see them as questions that you have to ask yourself in a certain order to find what uh, in the end is the right multimedia for you. And the first consideration that you have to take is to know your audience. After that, it's important to define your learning goals. Then you have to choose a specific teaching methods, a uh, method that fits with these learning goals. And after that, you choose uh, in the fourth step your multimedia. Um, after choosing your multimedia and before you're appraising, it's important uh, to take or uh, keep our disclaimer in mind, uh, which um, yeah, stresses how 
um, yeah, the subjectivity of uh, the appraisal process is uh, in place. And um, then you can go to appraise your specific chosen multimedia. And as a final remark, uh, you can apply it in, uh, in practice, but then it's also important to first pilot your uh, multimedia uh, by uh, in a setting and an audience that matches with the context that you're working in. Um, so let's take it for a spin. Um, imagine that I'm a teacher who wants to use this guideline to find uh, what is the correct multimedia for my classes. And uh, the first thing that I have to do is I have to know my audience. And this is important in order to personalize my multimedia towards uh, their needs and their background. So I'll have to take into consideration things like age, uh, maybe disabilities, cultural background, level of education and prior knowledge, for example. After doing that, I should define what my learning goals are. Uh, in our guideline, we have specified, uh, specified seven learning goals or stages according to the 7E model, which are uh, elicit, engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate, and extend. And within the guidelines, we will explain more extensively what the different learning goals are and also how this, these can be linked to, uh, for example, uh, other uh, educational theories like Bloom's taxonomy for cognitive development. And in this uh, example that we're having right now, I will choose to uh, focus on the engage stage as this focuses on improving the student's interest for a topic and their motivation for the educational content. So after I've done that, uh, it's time to choose a specific teaching method that uh, would fit this uh, learning goal. And in this case, I will choose for game-based learning as the interactive nature of this uh, teaching method is very suitable for uh, engaging students with the educational content. And uh, in our guidelines, uh, we also have multiple examples of uh, other teaching methods that can be applicable to the different learning object objectives that are given within the guidelines. Um, so after choosing a teaching method, it's important to choose a type of multimedia that fits with that teaching method. And within the AGAR, we have a specified guidelines for uh, comics, video games, videos, and animation. And of these four, of course, uh, video games would be the obvious choice for the teaching method of game-based learning. And uh, the guideline also contains recommendations on uh, other multimedia that uh, would be uh, yeah, applicable to the other learning goals and teaching methods. And so after taking our uh, disclaimer into consideration again, uh, it's time to go to the corresponding guideline for video games. And as you can see here, this is an example uh, cut out of the, the video games guideline. Uh, all the other specific guidelines, so the ones for videos and animations and comics as well, are made up in a similar manner. So they consist of a number of dimensions or themes. Um, and these are subdivided into multiple descriptive attributes. And for each descriptive, uh, a definition is given in the blue column that you can see here. And uh, we also have um, uh, written down an operationalization, uh, which can be seen in the fifth in the red column. And that is usually in the form of a statement or a question that the users of the guideline have to answer, uh, which they then can do by uh, filling in their answers in the last column by ticking the boxes. So now I'll uh, yeah, do a short demonstration of how uh, the appraisal guideline for video games would work. Uh, this one consists of two uh, separate dimensions. One is the educational value. The other is the game value. Uh, the educational value consists of various attributes that focus on uh, intended learning outcomes, also student knowledge, and the educational content of the game. The game value provides insight into more technical game attributes. And these are things that can help with conveying the educational content and engaging the students. And uh, for this demonstration, I will show you how three of these uh, attributes can be appraised by using the game Listeria Wars as an example. So one of the biggest strengths of video games is the fact that it allows the students to interact with the educational content. 
And um, in the guideline, this is measured with the game attribute of interaction, uh, which measures the extent to which uh, a game requires inputs and responses from its players uh, through engaging with the game elements. And uh, as you can see in the animation below, the player can strategically interact with the game by customizing their immune cells to make them stronger or faster. Um, but the game also requires constant inputs um, during the levels, which you can see below. Um, yeah, where they can place and control these immune cells to protect the game character uh, against the invading pathogens. Uh, so yeah, here in this case, we can. Uh, it would be fair to say that the game often requires interaction and responses from the players. Uh, the second game attribute that I will consider is uh, incremental learning. Uh, this measures if the learning activities and the teaching materials that are introduced uh, in the game are introduced with slight increments. So the different topics are not discussed all at once, but one after the other. And as you can see here below in the game, uh, not all elements are unlocked at the same time. Uh, the more complex immune cells and pathogens are unlockable at later levels, uh, which makes it possible for a student to progress through the educational content within a game. And uh, this is beneficial for the students as uh, they will not be overloaded with uh, all the information in the beginning uh, too quickly. And uh, yeah, that might demotivate students. Uh, so here uh, we can say, yes, the game gradually introduces concepts and information to the players. And the final uh, attribute uh, in this demonstration is uh, situated and authentic learning. Uh, the game, uh, this uh, focuses on whether the game provides a world or an environment that allows the player to connect their learning and gaming experience to their daily life. And uh, this is the case for Listeria Wars, because as you can see here, uh, the video game character uh, within the small screen goes about their, uh, their daily life, uh, doing things that are recognizable for uh, the players, uh, especially if you can see that he's working on his desk, that's quite recognizable for everyone in the past year, I think. And um, yeah, the consequences of this game character uh, influence the type of pathogens that enter his body within the game. And um, on the other hand, the success and the failure of the player influences the kinds of symptoms that the game character may experience. And all these aspects may help players connect the workings of pathogens and the immune system to the actions and symptoms that they may experience in their own lives. So for this game, we can say, yes, the game provides situations and environments that are recognizable for the students. And so all in all, the game Listeria Wars is a good example of a game that might be suitable for use in microbiology education because it introduces students to microbiology concepts in an interactive and in a gradual manner. Um, however, in this case, it is important to note that not everything in the game is completely factually correct. So the game gives a rough uh, idea of how an infection or a failing immune system might work. Um, but for a game like this, that is more focused towards entertainment, it is uh, very important for a teacher uh, that they explain uh, to the two students which parts are complete and factual and which parts are not, and also to explain how these might work in real life. Um, so next we have the appraisal guide for the use of comics in education. Um, the guideline consists of four different categories. Um, first, the comic characteristics, then the multimedia themes, um, social cues, and finally, anthropomorphism, which we will go into later. Um, so now I will demonstrate how the appraisal guide works by showing you some examples. Um, and first, I would like to show you an example of signaling. Um, signaling, as described by Meyer, states that people learn better when cues that highlight the organization of the essential material are added. Um, in the case of comics, this organization can be operationalized by the reading order of the panels. Um, so for this part of the guideline, you need to check whether the comic is read from left to right and down, which is the usual reading order of Western writing systems. 
um, from right to left and down, which is the usual reading order of, for example, Japanese comics, or whether the organization of the panels is more complex. Um, then if the organization is more complex, which is less beneficial for the learning process, the guideline asks whether the reading order is made clear through um, cues such as um, arrows, for example, um, as this will then enhance learning again. Um, here you can see a page of the comic Viral Attack. And as you can see, the panel organization is clear and the comic is read from left to right. Um, therefore, we can tick that box. And also the next question is then automatically not applicable uh, for this comic. Um, the second example I would like to show you is spatial contiguity, which states that people learn better when corresponding words and pictures are placed near each other rather than far away. And in comics, this can be operationalized as the tail of the speech balloon connecting the speech balloon to the character. Um, I chose to show these three um, separate panels of the comic to show you how this can be done in different ways. Um, in the first panel, you can see how um, this is done well as the tails of the balloon connect the speech balloons to the characters. Um, in the second panel, you can see how the character is not completely in the picture. However, the tail of the speech balloon still makes it clear who is talking. Um, but in the third panel, however, there is not a tail connecting the balloon to a character, so it's not really clear who is talking. Um, therefore, for this question, we take um, sometimes. And of course, it's not too bad if this happens once or twice in a comic, um, but it's important to make sure that your students will not get confused by this, uh, because you want to avoid them spending more time focusing on figuring out who is saying what, um, than focusing on the content of the comic. Um, the third and final example I would like to show you is anthropomorphism. Um, anthropomorphism means attributing human characteristics to non-human entities. Um, this part of the guideline will give recommendations on when to use and when not to use anthropomorphism. And after that, the guideline will help the user make an overview of the different types of anthropomorphism that can be found in the comic they are appraising. Um, here you can see the part of the guideline that provides the user with um, recommendations on um, when to use it and when not to use it. There is not really a good or a bad um, when it comes to the use of anthropomorphism, as it really depends on your audience and ultimate learning goal. Um, for example, anthropomorphism could enhance comprehension of a certain uh, topic for younger children, um, or maybe children with less knowledge on a topic. And it could also be helpful to engage students or to grab their attention. And it could be helpful when introducing a new topic to students. Um, it is recommended to try to not use anthropomorphism if students are required to have a thorough and in-depth understanding of a topic um, or when accurate knowledge is required, for example, for a test. Um, after the list of recommendations are the questions that will help uh, the user create an overview of the use of anthropomorphism in the comic they are praising. Um, here you can see a short comic and I will walk you through the questions. Um, so the first question asks whether human characteristics are attributed to non-human entities. Um, and as you can see in this comic, uh, the answer is yes. So that also means we should um, answer the next few questions. Um, then the next question is on structural anthropomorphism, which is present if the object has human physiological structure. Um, and in this case, the immune cell has a face and arms. So for this question, we take yes as well. Then structural anthropomorphism has two optional subcategories. Um, low level anthropomorphism is when the object only has a human face. And then on the other hand, there is high level anthropomorphism, which is when the object literally looks like a human. Um, but both uh, subcategories are not applicable here. So we pick no for both questions. Um, next is gestural anthropomorphism, which means that the object shows nonverbal communication. And in the first panel, you can see that the immune cell is pointing to the virus. So this is also a yes. And then we have character anthropomorphism, which is present when the object has human qualities and habits. And in this comic, the cell is showing the virus a um, wanted poster, which is a very human thing to do. So for this question, we also take yes. And then finally, aware anthropomorphism is present when the main object has thought and intention. And in this comic, this is also the case as the immune cells want to attack the virus and gives orders to take him away. 
Um, now, with this overview, you get an idea of the extent to which anthropomorphism is present in the comic. And in this case, it is present to quite a great extent. So when we go back to the recommendation, this comic would be fit for um, younger children, for example, to engage them and get them interested in the immune system. Um, it could also be used as supporting material when you want to introduce a new topic in your class. Um, however, it's recommended to not use this comic or at least not as your main teaching material when a thorough, accurate understanding of the topic is needed. Um, for example, for a high school test on the immune system. Um, finally, in the guideline, there's also a disclaimer saying that when you use a comic with anthropomorphism, um, you should always let your students know that this is the case. So you should make clear to them that these are not facts, but that it's just a way to talk about things. Well, last but not least, we have the part of the guide for the face of videos and animated videos. We divided the, um, these in four themes. Uh, in which content contains information included in the style of its presentation. Structure is for the dis distinguishing how the story and the information are arranged. Graphics and sound design describe how information is presented to the viewer and the theme other character uh, can uh, show characteristics of the video such as video duration and the need for prior knowledge. Uh, in case of an animated video, there's an additional theme uh, to appraise the extra characteristics they bring into. Uh, to give an example of the appraisal of the video, uh, we will discuss the following elements, uh, segmentation, signaling, and voice. Uh, but first, we will watch an example, um, which is a video about coronavirus, which explains workings to children. So, in today's episode, let us try to explore what exactly this virus is. What are the causes, symptoms and measures we need to take to stay safe from this illness called Coronavirus? Zoom in! Hey friends, by now, most of us are aware of the outbreak of the disease started in Wuhan, China caused by a new species of virus called novel coronavirus. Well, this is just a big, a tiny snippet. Um, but in this video, uh, segmentation uh, can be used to break up the video, to reduce the cognitive load for the viewer, and it can help make longer videos uh, turn into multiple bite-sized parts and segmentation can be uh, used in different forms and can be subtle or more noticeable, like an example just a few moments ago. Uh, the division in the chapters, which is uh, st stated in the first question, can simply be a distinction between introduction, middle, and end, which was the case in this video, or it can be in even more chapters. Um, like discussed previously, this example has a clear transition between the introduction and the next segment by using a few frames in between. So when we fill in the guideline, uh, in this case, we can fill in always in both cases, and it indicates a good use of segmentation within the video. So now if we look at signaling, um, signaling can be used to help guide the viewer's attention to important information like it was with comics. And this can be done by using either visual or auditory cues. And in this case, we will first look at the visual cues used in the example video. Um, and they can be then again divided into visual spatial contrast and dynamic contrast. Uh, in the example, uh, the video used different letter size, different fonts, and sometimes also different colors point out the keywords um, and distinguish them from the subtitles, which is a good use of visual spatial contrast. And at the same time, uh, it uses uh, the keywords by appearing them on screen with movement, which for, uh, helps them further highlight them. Um, so in case uh, of uh, appraising the signaling, uh, you can again fill in always, and again, it's a good 
way to indicate the good use of signaling uh, in the video. And now if we look to the final, uh, look to the auditory queuing, um, within the video, it uses uh, a bit less obvious queuing, um, but still the viewer can distinguish the key information by using the spacing within the videos. So we will uh, re-listen to the audio clip to see if you notice it. Most of us are aware of the outbreak of the disease started in Wuhan, China. It put a real good emphasis on the keywords of Wuhan, China. Um, and in addition, the example stated in, at the end of the introduction, uh, their aim, which is a form of um, using guiding questions um, uh, within the video. So in the case of embracing this, uh, you can fill in always for the guiding question and you can fill in often for uh, the verbal cues because they, because they can be made more obvious uh, in uh, a, another example. Um, so in education videos, the voice of the narrator has a huge impact on the learning and attention of the viewer. A voice which is relatable to the viewer can help them better understand the information and can help make a, uh, make a connection to the video. So you can judge narration by looking if it's human, if it's friendly, and if it's active. Um, in the example, there was the case, uh, it was the case for all three elements. So for all three elements, we can fill in yes. And to give you a better idea of the influence of the voice uh, and how it uh, influences how we process information, we will show you a short clip of another educational video. But first, we will refresh what we heard in the first example. Hey friends, by now, most of us are aware of the outbreak of the disease started in Wuhan, China, caused by a new species of virus called novel coronavirus. And now we can compare that to the second example and see if you notice a difference. Person coughs or sneezes, the disease causing germs from his body spread into the air. When a healthy person inhales the contaminated air, he also falls ill. Well, as you maybe have noticed, the second example, the narration was human and it was quite friendly, but it was very passive and didn't speak directly to the audience, um, which generally viewers less engaged with the content in, the, in those cases. And it isn't really a style that children normally speak in, thus it makes it difficult to connect to the content. But at the same time, it's good to remember the narration works in a video, how it works in the video depends on the target audience, like we discussed in the beginning of the guidelines. Yeah, so that uh, leaves us with the, the reflection, conclusion, and uh, future implications. So firstly, uh, the teacher remains responsible for the decision on whether multimedia content is appropriate for the context that uh, the multimedia is showed in. Um, also, whether the quality regarding the rules of cognitive overload is sufficient enough. And cognitive overload occurs um, when more information and stimuli are presented uh, than the working memory can handle. Um, also, the teachers uh, responsible for matching uh, the multimedia with the correct setting. So uh, is it used in the right way? Uh, but by using these guidelines that we created uh, for the appraisal of multimedia, the reasoning for choosing certain multimedia is more transparent. Uh, and it also justifies the comparison um, between certain multimedia regarding quality and uh, suitability uh, for the context. So when appraising uh, multimedia, the teacher decides uh, what are important themes for them, uh, for them, but also for their audience uh, and their environment, and can weight these specific themes accordingly. Um, 
And by themes, we mean those that, by Meyer that were referred to by uh, Sam in this presentation. Um, secondly, uh, most cognitive theories uh, are profoundly tested in controlled environments, which means that uh, practical research on long-term retention uh, and cognitive overload is necessary. Uh, for example, um, most research uh, tests retention immediately um, after exposure after exposure to a certain theme. Um, so more research on long-term retention, um, for example, six to eight weeks uh, instead of immediately, uh, is necessary to see uh, which themes work better in practical environments. And thirdly, our guidelines for an individual assessment of multimedia is very subjective. Um, so every person potentially interprets it differently. Therefore, it's difficult to create a standardized and generalizable guideline. Um, however, this subjectivity provides also the opportunity to increase awareness about uh, certain cognitive processes and uh, themes. And it, op it opens up room to discuss elements that could improve multimedia-based education. Um, this subjectivity is also the reason why we included the disclaimer explained by Bob at the very beginning. Um, also a picture is depicted here. Um, that emphasizes that doing an assessment is subjective and therefore we uh, recommend that teachers find a second assessor to compare, uh, to compare with and engage with a discussion uh, with that other person to understand the audience better, um, uh, but also to get a grasp of the learning goals and matching multimedia. We also uh, recommend, as Bob explained as well, to pilot the multimedia on the target audience to see if it works or not. So for the conclusion, uh, the guidelines are suggestions to the user and are difficult to consider a hard rule, but they create awareness and provide opportunity uh, for discussion um, and to improve multimedia-based education. The second conclusion is that the perfect multimedia uh, does not exist, as several themes and considerations can be mutually exclusive and very much dependent on context and personalization. Um, however, these guidelines are a tool to select the most adequate multimedia as possible by providing uh, transparency in the selection process of multimedia and by providing justification for measuring quality throughout multimedia. And for the future implications for the guidelines, um, these guidelines can be used by multiple educators uh, so they can create maybe a repository of multimedia uh, that they appraised where other educators can filter for specific themes according uh, to their needs and pre-select multimedia um, for their educational preferences. Um, so in this case, multiple educators can create a sort of database where uh, other educators uh, can filter for and select for uh, multimedia to use in their education.